on now so that it actually picks up something. That should be going for us now. So we'll start over. John chapter 19 this morning, if you would please we continue. In our study of this book, uh, we have looked in the previous week, last Lord's Day, Brother Tim spoke to us from Psalm 22. And this entire week, really I thought probably the best thing I could do is just replay what Tim said for you last week because it was fantastic and it covered a lot of things, some of which that we will see in, in John's Gospel in John chapter 19. John doesn't really give us a lot of detail that the other Gospels give us when it comes to the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus. So we'll fill in a couple of blanks here and there, but we, we do really want to concentrate on what John has to say. John, remember, is given a personal account. He's an eyewitness to these things. And, and he approaches his writing in that direction. And really, we see a very tender side of the Savior here at his crucifixion. Uh, other gospel accounts concentrate a, a good bit on, for, for lack of a better term, the brutality of the crucifixion. And it was a brutal way to die. The Romans were not really nice people. And we'll see some of that played out for us this morning here in John chapter 19 as well. I do want to mention one quick thing that's been on my mind for several months now as we've been approaching John chapter 19. This past summer, Laura and I and the children went out to Tallahassee. They had a Tallahassee America event, and there was a gentleman there who was one of the speakers that night. He said, we'll talk to you guys tonight about fortitude. And he said that fortitude means endurance. And he told the story of a Marine, a 25-year-old Marine, that was awarded a medal uh, from President Obama. And this gentleman and his partner, they went into a zone five times and they rescued Afghan soldiers and ultimately four fellow Marines. And he said, that's, you know, that's what you do for a brother. You endure. And I could not help but think of what the Lord Jesus pictures to us. You know, we read in the scripture that Christ, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross. And we read the Apostle Paul tells us, you know, for your friend, for a pretty good guy, you, you might think about dying. But Christ commended his love toward us that even while we were yet sinners, that he died for us. And he endured the things that we're going to read this morning for you and I while we were enemies of him. And so we want to keep that in mind, this great love that we think about. John chapter 19 is a rather lengthy chapter, some 42 verses. I think it's worth our time to read it, though. It's, it's a great chapter. And so please follow along with me. It'll be a little bit of a lengthy reading this morning, but well, well worth our time. And this is what John has to say, again, reading from the ESV this morning. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. You may see the word scourged or scourged. Scourge there, if you're reading from the King James this morning. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. And they came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you so that you may know that I find no fault in him or no guilt in him, excuse me. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. And the Jews answered him, We have a law that according to that law he ought to die, because he has made himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave no answer. So Pilate said to him, You will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? And Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. Verse 12 tells us, From then on Pilate sought to You are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out, sat down on the judgment seat at the place called the Stone Pavement in an Aramaic Gabbatha. 
Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. So he, being Pilate, delivered him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and went out. They took Jesus and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him with two others, one on either side, and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read the inscription for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priest of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but rather this man said, I am the King of the Jews. And Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless. It was woven in one piece from the top to bottom. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture which says, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. We read that last week, Psalm 22 and verse 18. So the soldiers did these things. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clophus, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took him into his home. And after this, Jesus, knowing that it was all now finished, he said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of the preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross for the Sabbath, for the Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead. They did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it, it has, excuse me, he who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth. And listen at the end of verse 35. It's really the point of the whole book, the whole gospel account, that you also may believe. For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And again, another scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was the disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, who had earlier come to Jesus by night, you might remember that story from John chapter 3, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes and about 75 pounds in weight. And they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had been lain. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. Our Father, this morning we're thankful again for your word. We're thankful for this account of the day in which the Lord Jesus gave his life to save all of those who will believe in him. So we thank you for this time together. We pray as we look at this, Father, that you would help us, your spirit would guide us and direct us in the things that are said here this morning, that you would receive the honor and the glory for it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So here we are, right? This is the early, early morning. You'll notice in, um, I lost my place here, but you'll notice in one of the verses we read, it was about the sixth hour, and that would have been about 6 a.m. So we're early, early, early in the morning time here. These um, <clears throat> bogus civil and religious trials that we talked about back in chapter 18, uh, they're, they're kind of completing up, they're ended, 
and Jesus is flogged. And I, and I said as we were reading that, if you have the ES, excuse me, if you have KJV with you, this morning you saw the word scourged. Interesting to pause there for just a second because we, we have more information about this in other places. But what we mean when we say the Lord Jesus was flogged or he was scourged, well, they had these whips. And these whips were a lot of little separate strips of leather. And, and I really don't know how long they were, but it was a nice handle and a, and a leather strip. And at the end of those leather strips, they were separated, se excuse me, separated from each other. And at the end of those little leather strips, there would be pieces of bone or pieces of metal tied to the end of them. So as that strap or that group of straps came across the back of the one who was being flogged or scourged, those pieces of metal and bone would sink into the flesh. And as that whip got ripped back like this, it would just pull flesh and meat away from those people. And the Lord Jesus was beaten in that manner. Form of punishment from the Romans. They're not really, really nice people. So we see in verse 2 that the soldiers, they twist together this little crown of thorns. So the Lord Jesus is standing there, and I, I pictured in my mind that he really is just barely standing there after the beating that he suffered. And they take this crown of thorns, and they twist it all up, and they put it on his head. And other gospel accounts tell us that they struck him on the head, and they buried those thorns. And, and we're not talking about a like you see a little thorn on a blackberry bush if you go out to pick a few blackberries. We're talking about real thorns in places. They pushed these thorns into the head of the Lord Jesus, and they covered him up in purple. It was mockery because the crown and the purple were really pictures of kingship, but in this particular instance, they were mocking his claim of kingship. And that crown was really interesting to me. If you remember the story in Genesis after the fall, you might remember what the Lord Jesus said to Adam. He said, the ground is going to bring now thorns, and you're going to toil with the ground to grow the things that you need. And it was a little reminder to me, the Lord Jesus yet again in another form bearing the curse of mankind's sin in that crown of thorns. And just as we read last week in in John, excuse me, in Psalm chapter 22, we see in verse 3 the, the mocking. We've already seen the striking of the whip and the blows to the head of the crown of thorns. And we see the mocking here in verse 3. They came up to him, hail, king of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Just as we saw back there. So Pilate, Pilate goes out to the people in verse 4. Twice, this is the first time. Twice, Pilate comes out in front of these people and says, listen, I find no fault in this man. He says here in, in verse 4, I am bringing him out to you so that you may know that I find no fault in him. And I can almost see Pilate kind of standing to the side and opening up his, opening up his hand like this. And here comes the Lord Jesus. You know as well as I know. You get a little cut on your head. You, you bleed fairly profusely. Crowns just showers of blood coming down his head, a back that looks like a plowed field from those stripes, barely able to stand, mockingly clothed in purple. Pilate says, Behold the man. That's a beautiful phrase, and I'll tell you why. John, in the very opening of his gospel account back in chapter 1, John laid it out clearly and without question, and he has shown through the entirety of this book that he wrote for us that Jesus is God. He is fully God. But he's laid out for him, just as Pilate said here, in this particular instance, John has laid out for us too that Jesus was fully man. So Pilate wasn't wrong in his statement. Behold the man. And that's important for you and for me. Because on this particular Passover, unlike the other Passovers that had occurred before this one, there was no animal sacrifice. You see, all the sacrifices of the Old Testament, all the 
bulls and the goats and everything that was sacrificed on the Jewish altars, the hymn writer would tell us, they could only cover sin. They couldn't take it away. They just covered it for a time period. You see, we needed someone like us. You might remember, let's go back to the Genesis again. We're going to reference Genesis a few times this morning, but I think it's important to us. If we were to go back to Genesis before Eve was created, God sent all of the animals by Adam. He sent all the animals by him. And you know what Adam saw about all the animals? He saw they were great. They were wonderful. He gave them all names. But none of them was like him. He didn't have anybody like himself. So the Lord Jesus put, excuse me, so God put Adam to sleep, took one of his ribs, and he made Eve. He made Adam a helpmate. He made one like him. You see, the Lord Jesus became like us. He took on flesh and blood. And his sacrifice didn't cover because he wasn't a type. The types had passed away. He was the Passover lamb. He was like us and therefore could be our substitute. We should be thankful for that man. Well, the beating and the crown of thorns and the bleeding of the Lord Jesus didn't satisfy the thirst for blood that the Jews had that day. And they cried out, crucify him, crucify him, here in verse number 6. Remember, this is coming from the religious people of the day, not the wicked people of the day. And we made this remark before, you can be very, very religious and you can be very, very lost. And they had completely missed the mark. All of the signs were there. They prided themselves on knowing the things that were written in the Old Testament Scripture, and they couldn't recognize standing before them was the one the Old Testament Scriptures had pointed to. Crucify him, they cried. And then for the second time, Pilate, who I think is really getting a little bit tired of these people right now. You know, Pilate's got things to do. Pilate works for the Roman government. At this time... The Jews were under the rule of the Roman government. He didn't have time for these Jewish people. He needed to be about the business of Rome. He said, well, tell you what, you take him, you go do what you want to with him. Well, the Jews say, verse 7, pardon me, sir, but we, we have a law. What do, you, what do you mean you have a law? You're under my rule right now. You'll abide by my law, by my laws. They had another law. You remember there were ten commandments given back in the book of Exodus, right? You remember what one of them was? Thou shalt not kill. And here they cry out for this one to be killed. Crucify him, crucify him. They're not worried about that law. Oh, you see, well, we, we have a law. We have a law that we, we, we really can't. This man made himself. He said, he said, he said, he said, he's the son of God. And, and he ought to be put to death. Well, that's not exactly accurate. Lord Jesus didn't just come saying that he was the son of God. You see, the Lord Jesus is the son of God. Not one who claims to be, but he is the only one who is. And I think if we look at verse 8 real quick, that kind of spooked Pilate a little bit. Look at what verse 8 tells us. When Pilate heard this statement, and that's the Jewish people saying he said he's the son of God. When Pilate heard them say that, it says he was even more afraid. So I wonder if Pilate kind of saw something in the Lord Jesus at that moment. Maybe, maybe there's a little something different about this man. I need to find out a little bit more about this. So he takes Jesus back in the headquarters. And he goes back in the headquarters with Jesus and he says, uh, hey, um, um, I don't think Pilate meant Nazareth. I think Pilate was really looking for some answers here. I think he had kind of been, for lack of a better term, spooked a little bit. He, he was afraid. Like, what am I getting myself into here. Well, the Lord Jesus didn't answer him. Pilate says, don't you know that I have authority to release you or I have authority to crucify you? And the Lord Jesus answers him, you, will have, you would have no authority over me unless it had been given to you from above. And we read that back in Daniel chapter 5 and verse 21, where it is God who sets up 
men in places of authority. But verse number 11 teaches us another thing. Look at the end of verse 11. Verse number 11 teaches us, and quite honestly, I believe, verse number 11 teaches us that there are some um, levels to sin, if you would. The Lord Jesus says, Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. Now, Pilate is just sort of a middle man, right? Pilate's sort of caught in the middle of this thing. We've got the betrayer in Judas. We've got the ones who are rejecting him in the Jewish leaders. They've chosen a murderer, Barabbas, over him to be released to them at the time of the Passover. Pilate's just kind of here. He's kind of in the middle of all this. And Jesus says, the one who delivered me over, he's got the greater sin. Now, exactly who he's referencing there, I don't know. I'll kind of leave that up to you. But that was a turning point. Look at verse 12. That was a turning point for Pilate. Verse 12 tells us, from then on, Pilate sought to release him. Pilate said, nope, we got to get rid of this guy. I got to get him freed. We got to get him gone. We got to get away from this mess and get, get this behind me. I got to release him. Now, we're not told exactly how Pilate did that, right? All we see there in verse 12 is that Pilate sought to release him. What we do see are the tactics that the Jewish leaders used not to get Pilate to let him go. And that was um, really two tactics, politics and self-preservation. That wasn't said right, was it? Self-preservation. Thank you. Two tactics that they used. First of all, Notice what they said. You release this man, you're not Caesar's friend. They bring politics into this, don't they? Because remember, Caesar was the emperor of Rome. And Pilate was one of his folks that was there in Jerusalem, ruling over the city. Now, they're talking about the Lord Jesus here at the end of verse 12. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. Because the Lord Jesus is a king. He is the king of kings. He says, if you're siding with this guy, you're an enemy of Caesar, and Caesar's going to do you in because he's coming after you, and he's, and he's going to just wipe you out and kill you because you can't align yourself with somebody who's a king. Kings oppose Caesar. So Pilate heard these things there in verse 13. He brings Jesus out to this judgment seat, the stone pavement. And he shows his true colors here. He shows that he's more concerned with what Caesar thinks than he is with the things of God and with things of eternity. So he brings him out and he says, behold, you're king. And I think he kind of says it sort of flippantly, right? He knows the Jews don't care about Caesar. He knows they can't stand him. They're ruling over them at this time. He's not really concerned about what they're saying. He's had multiple opportunities to let the Lord Jesus go at this point. He's not done it yet. So the Jews cry out in verse 15, crucify him, away with him, away with him, crucify him. And they said, we have no king but Caesar at the end of verse 15. You think about that. No king but Caesar. Not hardly even a generation removed from where we're standing right now. They're going to destroy the temple. What a king to align yourself to. God's going to march in and not leave one stone on top of another in 70 AD. And they're aligning themselves with this guy. This is the one. He's our king. Not this guy that you've got up there with that crown of thorns. We want nothing to do with him. Our king, our king is Caesar. So Pilate gives in in verse number 16. He gives in. They pledge their allegiance to the Roman Empire. Pilate says, he's yours. You can have him. So in verse 17, the Lord Jesus has to tote his own cross. And he totes his cross outside of the city to a place called the place of the skull. We refer to it a lot, as John does here, as Golgotha. And verse 18 tells us there he was crucified. So there he took his own cross out. They would have laid that cross on the ground. 
They would have laid the Lord Jesus on top of the cross. They stretched out his arm on this side. They stretched out his arm on that side. He's got this crown of thorns that's resting against the back of that cross. Probably would have taken his feet and overlapped his feet on top of each other like this right here. They used three nails. Drove a nail in each hand and they drove a nail between his feet. They nailed him to that cross. And then they stood that cross up and thunk. It went down in a hole so it could stand on its own. And just as we had read a few very short chapters ago in this gospel, the Lord Jesus was lifted up, signifying the death that he was going to die. You might remember that we read those. So there he is, suspended between an earth that has rejected him and a God of heaven that was about to pour a punishment upon him that Paul deserved. And he stood there hanging, suspended between the two. His own creation having nailed him to a cross, having rejected him. The devil is rejoicing. The devil is excited. The plan is coming together, the devil thinks. And so he's crucified. There are two criminals. There's one on either side of him. I told this story before, but it bears repeating again. Other gospel accounts tell us about these two criminals. And one of them says, hey, you know, if you're really who you say you are, won't you get down off that cross and save the other two of us as well? But one of the thieves is a repentant thief. And that thief says, hey, buddy, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't know what you're doing. And he looks at the Lord Jesus and he says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And the Lord Jesus says, today, today you're going to be with me in paradise. We have friends, I have several friends, and our friends will tell you that in order for you to gain entrance into heaven, you must be baptized. And they'll tell you in the next breath, except in special cases like them little babies and the thief on the cross. Well, the statement I've made before and the statement I'll make again this morning, if there is an except, then he's not God, because God is the same for every one. Now, of course, if you are a believer, we really do think that you should be baptized as a public demonstration of your faith in the Lord Jesus. But the Lord Jesus here welcomed this man into paradise on that day. We're going to get to that in just a little bit, in a little bit more detail. So uh, Pilate had this inscription we read in verse 19, put across the top of the cross, and it said, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Well, the Jews have just about lost their minds again. They've been doing that a lot in recent chapters, haven't they, in this book. No, 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 you can't write that. Pilate wrote it in three languages, Aramaic, Latin, and Greek, the three main languages of the day, so everybody could read it. There'd be no excuse. Everybody who walked by that spot. They said, no, 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 you can't say that. What you have to put up there is he said that he's the king of the Jews. And finally, finally, at what I consider the entire wrong time, Pilate gets a little bit of a backbone. He has some form of conviction. He says, nope, I wrote what I wrote. And he goes away. What a strange thing to hang your hat on there. So we see there, they're at the crucifixion, the soldiers, as we've already noted from back in Psalm chapter 22 and verse 18, they're casting lots for his tunic. It was of one piece. It was woven from the top to the bottom. So they didn't want to tear it. They'd already divided up his other clothes. But this was to fulfill the scripture that it would not be cut. So here we have the king of kings, the Lord of lords, the one who created everything that is created. Beaten. Crowned with thorns. And now, without clothing, suspended on a cross between heaven and earth, waiting for the wrath of God to be poured out on him. And in the midst of that, and we've mentioned just a little bit earlier, we see a very tender moment here. In the midst of all of that, think about that. The beating, the ridicule, the mock, the striking, nail-pierced hands and feet, hung to a cross, Lord Jesus looks down and he sees Mary. Mary had a need at that point in her life. Mary needed someone to care for her. The Lord Jesus very tenderly from the cross looks down at Mary 
and looks over at John. We see here the disciple whom Jesus loved. Remember, John never calls himself by name in this book. He always uses little phrases like that. So the Lord Jesus looks down from that cross. He sees Mary. He sees John. And he tells Mary, he says, Woman, behold your son. And he looks over at John and he says, Behold your mother. Very, very tender moment. During the crucifixion, the Lord Jesus makes arrangements for Mary to be cared for. And John happily obliges. Now, there is a lot that took place between verse 27 and 28 that the other gospel accounts tell us about. But John does not. If you, if you, look, at verse 20, if you look at verse 28 with me. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, he said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. So there was a lot that happened between what we just saw and what we read now in verse 28. So we're going to fill in a little bit of blanks with that from some other gospel accounts and what we know of. Beginning at around noon until about 3 o'clock, the world went dark. And I'm not talking about the kind of dark that cast a shadow. I believe it was a dark that you could not see your hand in front of your face. And for three hours, the Lord Jesus already beaten, already bleeding, already struggling. God poured out his wrath on his only begotten son that you and I deserved. Remember, God has to punish sin. Well, there was no sin in the Lord Jesus. So there in those three hours of darkness, God poured out his wrath on his only begotten son so that you and I could be saved. And there in his body on that cross, he paid the debt. And he reconciled us to a holy and righteous God. And when we use a term like reconcile, it's, it's an accounting term. Reconcile means to be brought back to or brought into balance with. You see, God has never left. It was man who fell away from God. And this was God's way of bringing back man to himself. The hymn writer wrote, Hated of men and of God too forsaken, shunning not darkness, the curse and the loss. There the love of the Lord Jesus bore it for you and for me. And then he says, I thirst. So, they take a jar of sour wine, we read in verse 29, and there's a little sponge, and they put it on a hyssop branch, and they put it up to him so that he can have a drink. Matthew chapter 27 and verse 34 tells us that earlier, at the beginning of his crucifixion, when he was first raised up, they offered him a mixture of vinegar and gall, but he refused it. He wouldn't take the drink. So why would the Lord Jesus accept a drink at the end of his crucifixion that he would not accept at the beginning? Well, from what I understand, the vinegar mixed with gall would have acted as a pain reliever, would have dulled his senses. The Lord Jesus couldn't have that. He had to bear the full brunt, knowing everything that he was bearing in his body there at the crucifixion for you and for me. And then at the end, he received this sour wine. I wonder to myself as I read that this week, when he said, I thirst, I wonder if there wasn't a legion of angels ready to fly down and give him a drink. I wonder if there wasn't a legion of angels ready to descend outside of the city gates of Jerusalem and get him off of that cross and usher him back home. I don't know if there were or if there weren't. But if they were, they were restrained. Because we read in several places of Scripture, I want to read a couple of them for you. Isaiah 53.10 tells us, Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. David wrote in Psalm 69 and 21, another messianic psalm. He said, For my thirst they gave me sour wine to drink. So if there was relief that could have come from heaven, God would not allow it. For if God had would allowed it, you and I would have no, me no means of salvation. So here he is. Beginning of his ministry, we saw that he used wine for joy there at the wedding of Cana. 
And now at this one, we see the close of his ministry, the sour wine of sorrow. And then his next and his last words in verse 30 really brought an end to Satan's plan. Because he said, it is finished. You see, there was no substitute for him like we saw for Isaac back in Genesis chapter 22 and verse 13. He was the substitute. And in that declaration of it is finished, the head of the serpent from Genesis 3 had been crushed, though the heel of the Savior had been but bruised. And you'll have to come back next week to finish the end of that story and see how it all plays out. Tim told us last week in our look at Psalm chapter 22 that in Psalm 22 and verse 31 we see the word done, and it can be translated as finished. And that's what we have here, that this work is done. When he said it is finished, what he meant was the payment for the penalty of sin was over. And it never, ever needs to be repeated again, that it is done. And then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Two things to consider about that, and man, we are quickly running out of time. I'll speed up a little bit. Two things to consider about that. First of all, when we read there that he bowed his head, in the Greek, what that means is to slant or slope. It does not tell us that he slanted his head down. It doesn't tell us that his chin fell against his chest. The Greek word there, again, means to slant or to slope. It doesn't tell us which way. Mr. Vine said that it was not the helpless drooping of the head after death, but it was the deliberate putting of his head into a position of rest because the victory had been won. And, and we don't really know. But after I read that and I studied on that a little bit this week, I can almost see the Lord Jesus saying, it is finished, and resting his head in a backwards slant against that cross with his final gaze being towards the heavens. I'll let you decide for yourself as to what you'd like to think about that, but it's a very interesting wording that we have there. It's also important because we read that he gave up his spirit. Remember what the Lord Jesus said in John chapter 10 and verse 18, I lay down my life. No mere mortal could have ever laid down their life, but this was not a mere mortal. This was the God man, and he had control of that, and he gave his life. The Romans didn't take his life. The Jewish leaders of the day didn't take his life. He freely for me and for you gave his life. Well, again, we see that the Jews are all concerned now. You know, we've followed through with our plan, but hey, it's a day of preparation. We can't let those bodies stay on the cross. Hey, hey, Roman guards, y'all go and uh, y'all go break those legs for us, please. Now, you imagine for a second. You're there, hung on this cross. You hold your hands out like this for just a little bit. You get really tired, don't you? Well, from what I understand about a crucifixion, you can't really support yourself. So you're constantly falling, and your hands are kind of up like this. Well, it puts pressure on your shoulders and in your lungs, and you just you can't breathe. So you're using those legs and trying to straighten yourself up a little bit, trying to stand a little taller so that you can get a breath of air. And you've been there. It's been three hours. You've been hanging on this cross. And along comes a Roman soldier, and he breaks your legs so that you can't do that anymore. I'm telling you, they were not nice people. So they broke the legs of two thieves, and they get to the Lord Jesus, and he's dead. He's already gone. And that, too, is to fulfill Scripture. You might remember back in the book of Exodus when they were talking about the Passover. Very specific instructions were given to them that you could not break a bone of those little lambs. And we read in the Scripture that not one of his bones would be broken. But what a soldier does is a soldier takes his spear and he jams it into his rib cage, and out flows blood and water. And it's been said that blood speaks of cleansing from the guilt of sin, and water speaks of cleansing from the defilement of sin. And we've seen that in the past as the Lord Jesus washed the disciples' feet. You know, you're clean, you're just dirty down here where you've been walking on the old earth. I personally think what we have here, I personally think, and so what we have is we have a soldier checking to make for sure the Lord Jesus was really dead. 
They come to him and say, oh, he looks like he's dead. Well, if I jam him with a spear, he'll, he'll react to that, right? He'll, he'll move, he'll hurt, he'll cry out from pain or whatever the case might be. But he was, as we've already read, dead because he had given his life for you and for me. Well, the chapter comes to a close. Joseph of Arimathea comes to get the body. Nicodemus meets him. They anoint the body. They wrap it in linens. They put him in a tomb where no one had ever been lame before. So very quickly, our, our so what this morning. You might be asking yourself, why? Why all of that? Well, it goes back to the story of Nicodemus. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And this is the way that it had to be accomplished. The Bible tells us that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. All of those pictures, all of those Passovers, all of those sacrifices that had been made led up to this point, this one that finished the need for sacrifices, the one whose sacrifice was sufficient. And you may ask yourself, well, where'd Jesus go? Because we read in the scripture that he wasn't going to let his holy one see corruption. So while the body of the Lord Jesus laid there in that tomb, really, was Jesus there? Did he just lay there for three days? Let me suggest a little something that Papa has told me in the past, and I think it's really worthy of our consideration. John chapter 14 and verse 12 verse 28, John chapter 15 and verse 10, John chapter 16 and verse 28, and John chapter 17 and verse 11. In all five of those instances, the Lord Jesus tells his disciples, I go to the Father. I'm going to the Father. I'm going to the Father. The Lord Jesus told the thief on the cross in another gospel account that we've already recounted this morning, today you will be with me in paradise. When someone dies, the body is here but their spirit is no longer with us anymore. So with the Lord Jesus. I think in spirit, he was with the Father for those three days. The Apostle Paul wrote in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and verse 6 through 8, he said, hey, if you're absent from the body, you're home with the Lord. So Tim had mentioned this morning that it was Palm Sunday. And I said, well, yeah, it's Palm Sunday, but we ain't going to talk about the triumphal entry because we covered that back in John chapter 13. Not so fast. That was a triumphal entry right there. A triumphal entry of a Savior crucified, having settled the debt of sin, ascending into the abode of the Father. And can you imagine the smile on that thief's face when he got there too, realizing what he had done? So my question for you this morning is this. If the Lord tarries, there's a day coming when your spirit will be separated from your body. Where is it going to go? There are two options. There's an eternity in heaven or there's an eternity in hell. It's just that simple. The Lord Jesus has done what we read about today so that you may know just like that thief on the cross, you may know that you can have entrance into the abode of God in heaven for all of eternity. Well, well, Paul, how do we get there? Well, John chapter 14 and verse 6, the Lord Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No man comes to the Father except by me, or except through me. Well, how do you get to the Father through Jesus? Well, the Apostle Paul summed that up really easy to the Philippian jailer. In Acts 16 and 31, he says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And what are you saved from? Because in order to be saved, that means something bad was going to happen, right? Well, you're saved from that eternity in hell. So the question that we all need to have settled in ourselves, where is your trust? Is your trust in that finished work on the cross that we read about this morning? If it is... You're heaven bound, and we praise the Lord for that. If your hope and if your trust is in anything other than that, you're not. You're bound for eternal damnation. Don't let that be your destination. 
Our Father, we thank you again for the time to read from your word. We thank you for the things that we see in it. We thank you for this wonderful sacrifice that has been made for us. Father, we know that this is not the end of the story. Our Lord Jesus laid there in that tomb after having finished that work, his body laid there in that tomb. Lord, we look forward within your will next Sunday of finishing that story and seeing what happened to that body as it laid there. So, Father, we pray if there's anyone here that does not know truly that they are saved, that, Father, they would speak to one of us or talk to us, get in contact with us, whether they're watching on the Internet or are here with us, that we would just be able to show them and point to them how they can know sins forgiven and know a home in heaven waiting for them. We thank you for the lovely Lord Jesus. We thank you for this wonderful sacrifice, this great work that has been done for us. And we just pray now you would bless our day, watch over us and care for us, and bring us back together again in your will. In Jesus' name, amen.